So um, I love Johnny. He's an all-terrain human. Uh, whether it's Vancouver in June, Italy in October, or uh, was it November in Seattle, men's wearing <laughs> polo shirt, shorts, and flip-flops. <laughs> Uh, I did consider wearing what we dubbed the uh, Johnny uh, uniform, but I <laughs> wanted to keep it kind of professional. Uh, <laughs> uh, he was, um, he, Johnny worked at, at Hewler Packard for a super long time. I think you were actually working on printers, right? Yes, I was. Oh, you poor man. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Uh, I, I recently watched, uh, I, was, I was showing Loris Office Space for the first time. <laughs> uh, and and it, it made for a good watch. Um, I think it's a very software you can love uh, movie. <laughs> um, recently, uh, Johnny's been working at a company called Tuple, Tuple, and they make like a, it was a pair programming software. And it runs on, on Mac, obviously. And pretty much they hired Johnny, and they're like, hey, uh, make it work on Linux, please. And, and as far as I'm, cause I, like, it just, it, it works, right? Yeah, a little bit. Oh, okay, yeah. a little bit, which is still quite impressive. Uh, so today, we, uh, we're going to talk about abstraction. Um, and there, we, we might be seeing some sort of iconic video game uh, later on. If we have time. So, we'll oh, no, no, I want it. Okay, okay thank I'll you. I'll try. Anyways, uh, oh, and he's uh, really good at phasmophobia. Uh, that's a, <laughs> I, I, we played together and I made him die a bunch and I, I <laughs> like, uh, was scared shitless. Uh, it, was, it was a good time. So if you want to get scared, uh, hang out with Johnny. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> All right, well, welcome to my talk. Um, how to kill your API with abstraction. I'm Johnny, I'm a software engineer currently working at Tuple. I'm also very active on GitHub under the username Marler8997. I currently have 393 repositories on GitHub and I have a problem. <laughs> so let's dive right in in learning how to kill our APIs with abstraction. So let's talk about X11. Most Linux users will have heard of X11, probably because they've run into problems with it. <laughs> it's a client-server model with a protocol. Um, the clients connect to the server, and they send graphics primitives and receive user inputs from the keyboard and mouse. Um, the X server also takes those graphics primitives from all the clients and then composites them into a cohesive desktop. Perfect. So in 2008, the uh, Wayland protocol was introduced to replace X11. And Wayland m will probably lead to the eventual death of X11, but right now it's a very, very slow death. Um, X11 is still the default compositor for many Linux distros 15 years after Wayland was introduced. Um, X11 applications can also work with Wayland compositors through a compatibility layer called XWayland which pretty much all major Wayland-based Linux, distri Linux distros support, at least as far as I know. So some questions come to mind here. W why did we create Wayland? What was wrong uh, with X11? Does it do something that X11 can't do? Um, and then just from reading about X11 online, why, why do so many people run into issues with X11, and why are those issues so difficult to triage? Um, I commonly see people just end up throwing their hands in the air and giving up on X11. So to gain some insights here, let's, um, let's look at a Hello World application that uses X11. <laughs> so. We have uh, 92, 92 lines of code program here. It's, it's not that bad. Um, simple X11 client, it creates a window, prints Hello World to it, and it even has a secret bonus feature that we'll see in a second. Um, here's your standard uh, libc include files. Um, and then we have a couple of include files from X11. Here at the top of the program, we call X open display. And what this will do is connect to the X server, exchange some information about the session, and then you're, you're ready to start drawing things. Um, here's where we create a window. We ask the X11 server to make a window for us and give it some sizing information, some color formatting information. 
And here's where we create a graphics context, and that's what you need in order to draw things to the window. And it caches things like a foreground color and a background color. After that, we call X select input, and this is where we register for events from the X server. Here we get a key press, a button press, and then an exposure event that will tell us when it's ready to accept draw commands. And here's where we uh, call X map raised, which is how we ask the X server to show our window to the user. Um, here's the event loop where we actually handle those events that we just registered for. Um, here's the expose event. Uh, you can see we, at, we check if it's the first time we've seen it, and if so, we will draw our hello world message to the window. Um, here is the button press event, and it, this is our secret feature, which we'll see in a moment. And uh, here's the key press event, which will just listen for the letter Q to be uh, pressed down uh, in order to tell us to quit. And lastly, here at the end, we uh, get some cleanup code. So, great. Um, here's the command to build the C application. Obviously, we're, you know, even though it's a C application, we're going to use the Zig toolchain to do this. Um, and we just tell Zig to build an executable from our C source code and to include the C and X11 libraries. So let's see if we can get that building here. Zig build XC hello dot C dash X. I think that's right. There you go. Built quickly. Hello libx11. Or do you run? It does, it showed up on my other monitor, so let me drag this over. And there you go, and here's our secret feature, get ready for it. <laughs> Q. All right, so we press the letter Q, and it should quit the window for us, and great, we get no errors. Successful first demo. All right, so that example was obviously in C, um, but what if we ported that same example to Zig? We still use the same X11 library, the same headers, the same uh, library files, but let's just use Zig instead. Um, it's about the same size, actually four more lines of code, but that's okay. Um, let's compare some of the pieces here. Um, this one's a pretty important one, actually. So in the C version, we include these header files, and it just, it's just dropping text into your program. Um, and in the Zig version, we're actually encapsulating everything from the X11 library into a namespace. And this is really important. In fact, this actually affected me at my job because the, C, the X11 library thought it was a great idea to introduce a preprocessor macro uh, called none. You know, no, nobody's ever going to need that identifier. So I, I did waste quite a few hours at my own job uh, trying to first triage this. And then after that, we, we kind of learned our lesson. We're only going to include the X11 headers when absolutely necessary. Um, and we have to use some strange techniques to make that work. We actually have to copy some of the type definitions from these header files into other places and maintain them ourselves because of that. But that's just what you got to deal with in C. In uh, Zig, this is completely not an issue because of that beautiful namespace. So here's another difference. Um, in the Zig version, we check uh, if X open display returns null by using the or else keyword. And that's just a little nicety. It informs the Zig type system that the display can't be null. It's less potential for bugs that forget to check whether it's null and could even potentially uh, result in more efficient code, which is nice. Um, and this error message is, is a little cut off here, but we'll come back to that. Um, this example demonstrates an interesting API decision from libx11. The X size hints structure that we see here, it contains a lot of fields, but it allows the user to only initialize a subset of them. And it tells the API which ones it has initialized by setting this flags field that you see at the bottom. And you can see that we've set the position and size flags and are also setting the x, y width height fields accordingly. However, this API has a foot gun uh, because it will result in uninitialized memory access if the flags ever become out of sync. And that's, that's a problem because uninitialized memory access is the type of bug that will go dormant for years until it's in a customer environment. Um, so we want to avoid that. And Zig has a really nice uh, set of semantics uh, where you can 
actually represent this exact thing using struct fields with default values. That is the exact semantics that X11 is trying to represent here, and Zig rep can represent that perfectly in its language. And this is what that would look like. Um, we add a new function called init x size hints to create an instance, and we just literally include the fields that we want to include uh, in that message. Um, anything that's not included will get a default value. As you, here's an example implementation of what that could look like. And this is a common pattern that's used throughout the uh, Zig build system, for example, or uh, it's commonly used in some generics that have options such as the general purpose allocator. And you can see here, um, we only include the two fields, so it could fit on the slide, but there's many more fields that could be added here. And each field is an optional to a struct that the caller can specify uh, what the values are. And the implementation, we just need to write this once, and then it can be reused, and we'll always be correct after that. Um, we set the flags to zero, we check each field, and then set the values and the flags accordingly, so it uh, won't ever get out of sync. So, great. Um, in the next part of our program, the C and Zig versions look almost identical, except for one major difference. Um, in the Zig version, you'll see a bunch of these underscore equals, and that's because in Zig, you can't just silently ignore return values. Hopefully, it makes the developer you know, think for a second, maybe I should be handling those. Maybe, maybe there's an error code in there. So, that's nice. Um, the, the event loops are pretty similar. There's just one major difference, and I mention it because I, it actually caused a bug in my program in the C implementation. I forgot to add a break statement in one of these cases. But in Zig, uh, case fall through is not a thing, so there's another win for the Zig version. So we've already gotten some benefit out of using Zig, even without addressing any issues with the underlying X11 library. So let's go back to that error message we saw at the beginning of the program where X open display can fail. So error handling. Um, the error message that I've crafted here is X open display failed. The error might have already been printed to standard error. And the error note is this, in case that helps. <laughs> so you might be wondering why did I word the error message that way? And, and you're gonna find out in a second. So is this the really the best error message that we can give? Um, the documentation for X open display says it will return null on an error, but it doesn't say how to get any information about what failed. So this doesn't seem right to me, but let's look at the implementation. Here's a snippet from that implementation. Um, we can see here's where it returns null. Um, but I don't see it setting an error code or saving any information that could be retrieved later. We do see a code comment, so there's that. <laughs> Unfortunately, code comments aren't visible to end users. Here's another uh, example where it just returns an old. In this case, we would get an error node because C alloc uh, is a good API that does set an error node that you can get later. Um, here's another use case where it looks like, oh, maybe it is setting some error information, but that's just cleanup code. Nice try. Okay, so here, this is another snippet inside of that function, and we are actually reporting an error. We're printing a message to standard error. <laughs> of course. <laughs> so with this, X11 has coupled itself with a dependency on standard error. Now the application responsible for ensuring this error gets propagated has to make sure standard error is always propagated to the user. What makes this worse is most applications that use and depend on X11 don't know that they depend on it. It's commonly found at the bottom of much larger frameworks like uh, GTK, QT, and SDL. So because of this decision X11 has made, every single application that has this library at the bottom of its stack now needs to handle the additional standard error reporting mechanism in addition to whatever error reporting mechanism the framework also introduces. Great. <laughs> so if you Google X open display failed, It'll pull up a lot of questions, discussions. Here's one example from, of a user trying to run X11 VNC. Um, notice the last line of the error. 
There may be xlib error messages above with details about the failure. It uh, looks a little bit familiar to the one that I came up with. Um, and I crafted my error message before I ever saw this. But we can't blame x11 VNC for this. This is about the best that they can do. They not only don't know why X open display failed, they don't even know whether it decided this error was worthy of being printed. So you can find many examples of this on the internet. <laughs> X11 makes engineering more like a game of Clue. In many cases, applications can try to hide or work around a bad APIs and still provide a good end user experience but in this case, there's really nothing applications can do. So what do we do? How did we get here? How can we do better? Well, in comes XCB. And uh, this was a little project. It was a uh, complete rewrite of libx11, complete overhaul, trying to make it more modern, smaller, uh, more modular. And this took place uh, in about the early 2000s. And I won't go into uh, the details of this API, but it still suffers from some of the same problems that libx11 does, such as non-existent error handling. It does make some improvements, though. I have a theory, and I think the problems with these APIs may have been a big contributor into why Wayland was created in the first place. I think with better APIs, it may never have needed to have been created. Something to think about. So we were able to identify some issues with X11 by looking at Hello World. But X11 is a pretty high level and abstract library. It provides a lot of functions that you know, creates a window, um, sets attributes, draws things to the screen. But ultimately, it's just sending data back and forth from the X server. So when does that happen? Um, all this abstraction prevents us from actually learning and knowing how X11 works under the hood. It's just a lot of abstraction. So what I wanted to do was I, I, I'm really interested in graphics programming, and I wanted to learn all I could. So I thought, oh, let's start with X11 and see how it actually works. And I had started by using the libx11 library, but that basically taught me nothing. So my only real option at this point is to go implement it myself. So this is an exploration into the X11 protocol, not the library, how to write better APIs, and see what kinds of new APIs that the ZIG programming language can enable. So if we're going to explore a new X11 client library, how do we avoid making the same mistakes? And I start this process by asking the question, what is the perfect library for any given application? No library. If there is no library, every application would implement exactly what they need and nothing more. It's literally perfect. The downside of this approach is it takes a lot of time and effort to go and re-implement everything for every single application. So in practice, we give up a little bit of perfection in exchange for some time and effort. So one of the principles we can take away from this is that we should be careful of abstracting too early. This means we're going to need to copy and paste similar code throughout. I know it's not dry, but that's OK. It's far easier to create a new abstraction from duplicated code than it is to take an existing one and refactor it into a new one. And we want to make refactoring easy. That's what we're optimizing for, because this is an exploration. So I came across this uh, great uh, blog post, and there's an accompanying talk, The Wrong Abstraction. There's a quote I particularly like. Duplication is far cheaper than the wrong abstraction. I think that's a good principle to keep in mind. So how do we know whether an abstraction is good? There are some questions we can ask about abstractions. I think these are good questions we can do, ask to evaluate them. So is it uh, a common? Uh, how common would this abstraction be used by applications? Is it useful? Um, how many use cases can or can't use this abstraction? Does it impose any restrictions on the application? For example, would it require the application to ensure that standard error makes it to the user? Is this API making decisions that it doesn't need to be? For example, is it picking an allocation strategy instead of letting the application pick one? 
something that Zig did differently than everyone else had done previously. Is there unnecessarily, unnecessary coupling? Uh, is it composable? Is it made up of pieces that can be reused and combined in various ways to enable new functionality? So a few of the principles that um, I come up with from this is bottom-up design. So rather than trying to start out designing the perfect API, maybe start writing some actual application code and let that inform your API later. Also, the null hypothesis. So if the perfect library is no library, start with that. Just, just don't use a library. Um, and the extra benefit of this is it gives us a baseline that we can use to compare against any potential abstraction candidates that we want to evaluate. So, hello world again. But this time we're not going to use libx11. We're going full handmade. So, our libx11, our zigx library will live in a module named x, which we import here on line two. Further down, we call a connect function from our X module. Now, this function doesn't do as much as the X open display function did. It just connects a socket to the X server. It doesn't do any exchange of information. So in this case, though, there's a big difference. It can actually return a zig error code. Wow. So our application will log an error name, and it will log a display string that we couldn't connect to. Um, the display string is a detail about X11 that is not abstracted from the user. The user has to know about it and has to know how it works. And by forcing the application to pass in a display, I think it encourages them to include it in their errors. Um, so, so I kind of you know, massage the API to try to encourage a behavior that I think is going to be better for the end user. So let's compare the output we get from setting an invalid dis display to what we get with libx11. We've seen this error message before. Um, we're going to uh, artificially set an invalid display wat. And we can see X open display failed. We have no idea why. Um, this was one of the cases libx11 didn't think was worthy, again, of an error message. Um, Zig X, what do we get? Oh, no display number, of course. Uh, the, an X11 display string needs to have a colon display number. So let's go ahead and add that. Back to libx11, what does it do? What does it think about this? Oh, we get an error note this time, 11. E again. <laughs> Perfect. I know exactly what went wrong here. <laughs> Zigx, what do we get? Temporary name server failure. Ah, what's not a valid host name? It couldn't resolve it to an IP address. Zigx tells us exactly what caused our error. Wow. In contrast with these two libraries, when I, I realize how unhelpful libx11's error reporting is, I just I can't help but take a moment to wonder how many hours have been wasted because of this API. Oh well. <laughs> the next thing we need in our x11 library is to set up the x11 connection. So we do this by sending the connect setup message. Um, we could create a function called send connect setup. However, that couples message serialization with message transmission. And maybe we don't need to couple those things together. There's already a good abstraction around transmission, the socket API. It's great. So adding our own abstraction on top of it would need some justification, I think. Well, what should our serialization API look like? Now, this, this uh, insight kind of just comes from experience in dealing with network APIs, but I find that it's common for information about a message to be available at different times. Sometimes the information needed to calculate a message length is fully available at comp time, even if the content of the message isn't available till runtime. So this means that if we decouple the API to calculate the length of a message and the API to serialize its contents, we can enable more use cases, specifically the ability to allocate and serialize messages without needing to resize them or relocate them or even serialize them on the stack. The code ends up looking like this. Here we call a function to calculate our connect setup message length, but we specify that we do so at comp time. This enables us to allocate our message on the stack 
So there's no need for a heap or an allocator. Um, note, however, that this would only work if the auth proto name and data fields were known at comp time, which in reality probably won't be the case. But we could still get around that too. Um, the X11 protocol has a maximum length for these fields. And if we expose that API, we can still create a buffer that's large enough to hold any connect setup message and still store it on the stack without heap allocation. Awesome. So now that we've sent our connect setup message, it's time to read the response. Our zigx module provides the read connect setup header function, and it takes in a reader. And this is one of Zig's clever interfaces. Um, that means that we can provide support for reading messages without restricting ourselves to a particular transport. So again, decoupling transmission with serialization. So a little further down, we see the code to create a window. This is a good example that kind of is a culmination of a few of the ideas we've gone over. The arguments are split here into two sections, the first ones being the required arguments and the second ones being the optional ones. For the optional ones, we make use of the optional struct fields that we saw in our X size hints example. Um, and create window has 15 options, but we're only setting two of them, BG pixel and event mask. We're also leveraging the maximum length of a create window message to serialize it on the stack. That's hot memory, use it if you can. Another nice convenience is the ability to set the class to dot input underscore output something enabled by Zig's brilliant enum value namespacing semantics. So we're now using multiple features unique to Zig. Making an API in C would need to make concessions in order to have this uh, level of convenience. They would need to make concessions in both type safety and introduce foot guns to even come close to something like this. So the rest of the uh, Hello World program uh, using our Zig X library had a lot of the same structure as the original libx11 version. It ended up being about twice as long in terms of lines of code. Both programs appear to behave identically to the end user, but they still have some interesting differences, even past the source code. Um, so first, let's look at how difficult it is to build these projects. So here's how you build uh, the zigx version. It depends on zig and has no other dependencies. The command to build our libx11 program is not so different, but there's one part that's kind of a big deal. Can anyone guess which part that is? The C one. That, that one is a big deal, but Zig has really good support for C. So actually, that one's kind of a big deal. These five characters may not seem like much to the untrained eye, but they introduce a huge dependency on our application. On some systems, this won't be an issue. You simply install the correct X11 development packages via your favorite package manager. However, if you need to build it yourself, you've now inherited a whole suite of build tool dependencies, core utils, auto tools, GNU make, Python, package config, M4. And I actually know the exact set of programs you need because I wrote a build.zig script that would build libx11 for you in a containerized environment. I went through every single program and added them one by one until it successfully built. So that was fun. So the x11 library also means that we've limited ourselves to the platforms that the libx11 developers want to support. This means we're probably not gonna be able to build on Windows and we also probably won't be able to run on or cross-compile to Windows as a target. So what about our ZigX application? Does it run on Windows? It does. <laughs> For those of you wondering, uh, Windows does have a X11 server called Moba Xterm, which I've used for many years. It works great. Um, and this was particularly memorable because this worked the first time I tried it. Literally. It also runs on Mac. That's cool. So, also note that it's trivial to cross compile the ZigX version of the application from one platform to another. Here's how we can build a Windows executable from Linux, or from Mac for that matter. Good luck doing that with the libx11 version. 
So there's a couple other differences between these two versions of Hello World. Um, if we run LDD on Hello ZigX, it's not a dynamic executable. Below, you'll find a real URL which contains the Hello ZigX binary that I uploaded to GitHub. You can download it right now, copy it to your Linux machine, chmod plus X on it, and run it and see if it works. Now, I, I want to give you one caveat that I haven't imp fully implemented X11 authentication, so it, your results may vary, but it should at least run and give you an error message, hopefully. Here's the comparison to the libx11 version. And this actually isn't as bad as, as you know, some other programs. But you can see I built this on NixOS. This is probably only going to run on NixOS. And the, the biggest egregious part of this is the hard-coded absolute path to the loader that's really not going to run on anything but NixOS. So um, one more difference between it was the memory usage. And uh, I'm not sure why they differ so much in memory. Um, some of it will have to do with those runtime dependent, those uh, SO files that need to be loaded. But you can see that the uh, shared region of memory uh, is only a small part of the total memory. Um, here, it's taking about 20 times as much memory as our ZigX library. So let's uh, take a look at a couple example programs. I had, I've had some fun in this exploration and have been... Uh, playing around with it a little bit. I did a Twitch stream a few months ago and started this project called Image Viewer. And it uses libx11. Um, I think I can run it here, Image Viewer. It has an x11 backend. It also has a Win32 backend, um, which is cool. But you can actually run the x11 backend on Windows if you want. I don't know why you'd want to, but you, know, you can do that. Let's see it in action. We're going to give it a file name, .png, run it. And there it goes. It displays the image uh, in a window. And it works great. Let's take a look at another application. So is this using ZigX? Yeah, this is using ZigX. Yep. Uh, video server, I believe I called it. So uh, this application is listing all of the webcam devices on my machine. I can go ahead and select one of them, and I can say preview. And Yo. there you go. We're doing video. The next level. Very cool. And I'll show you one more demo here. Um, where, where's my to-do at? You can you can download that and run it right now on your Linux machine. Okay. Here's the last demo. Um, this is actually the uh, source code released by id Software for Doom, the Doom engine. And uh, it had some issues that I had to fix, but uh, I went ahead and removed the dependency on libx11 and replaced it with my wonderful ZigX library. Let's see if it runs. Uh, resolutions were a little smaller back in those days. <laughs> now, I'm not doing any uh, shared buffer buffer uh, buffers here. I'm just literally every frame passing the entire set of bits over to the X server, which is really not the most efficient way to do it. So don't be too hard on me if it's a little choppy. But there we have. Doom. Now with more zig. I love, I love these uh, sound effects. <laughs> <laughs> they really knew how to do sound design back in that time. So uh, I think I'm going to end it here. We, we have a couple of conclusions. Um, I just wanted to explore something. I, my main goal here is to try and improve the Zig community 
try to uh, get people thinking about different ways that they can make APIs, I think there's a lot of room for improvement, as you can see. So don't be afraid to explore new kinds of ideas, new kinds of APIs. Um, don't try to hide and protect the application through too much abstraction. That's a really big one. And keep your APIs minimal. Do one thing and do it well. Yeah. That's all I have. Uh, thank you for the talk. Uh, were, there, were there any linked libraries for the Doom executable, like sound? Um, the Doom game actually has a separate binary for the sound. Oh, damn, okay. Yeah. I, I did not know that. Uh, do we have any, any questions for Johnny? Um, so with X11, by the way, great. That was really cool, really cool talk. Uh, with X11, do they have like compatibility tests or any way of verifying your, your library against what is expected? Or is it just like y YOLO and hope that you did it right? Um, I would say, uh, I could say it's snidely, but the, I would say your, your test bed is the X11 uh, applications, so, or the X server itself. So running, running one against the other, I think, is the best way to do it. That's, I, I, like, um, I like when I don't have to write any tests because they've all been written for me already. So. Next question. Hi, so I presume this was necessary for your work with the, um, I mean, for the software that you're making, the pair programming, <laughs> right? Um, well, ZigX, I wouldn't say is like a production ready type of thing. There's a lot of stuff, you know, that hasn't been implemented. It's, it's still pretty, you know, low level and get rough around the edges. Um, but I think uh, this could be a big benefit for actual real world Linux applications to use a strategy like this in order to be more binary compatible. You have things like Flatpak, App Image, um, Docker, all these things are trying to solve this really difficult problem, and this is another uh, way to solve it, and I think it's a pretty good way. So I have I actually had two questions like coming from this. So one is, uh, if, if you're gonna use this in your day job, that means it has a funded future. Uh, that's one question one. Uh, maybe you can comment on that. And the other one, you, you so Firefox is running less than 10% on Wayland. Like you had a choice. Uh, did you did you think about like doing this on Wayland, or it's not a choice in your domain? Like, did I? Why did I choose to invest in X11 instead yeah, of? Yeah, we can rephrase it that way. Um, I think it was just more about about the order of history. For me, you know, like I, I figured that um, X11. By looking at X11, I can see what is, the issues were, were and learn from that. Wayland may have solved all those issues, and then you know, I, I don't get to see the the bad stuff. Um, but the the question about whether ZigX is going to uh, continue to live, and maybe we'll have a resurgence of X11, and maybe Wayland's going to die next because of ZigX. <laughs> I wouldn't hold my breath on that, but. <laughs> You know, you can hope, I guess. Okay, so you but you don't have immediate plans to use it in your in your job, basically. Um, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say that. I, I think there may be some real world. I, actually, um, one of my coworkers he runs sound system at a theater in uh, Europe, and they have this kind of complicated uh, piece of machinery, and he wrote a protocol to communicate with it, and he wanted to uh, have a GUI application that other users could control it with. And this would be like a perfect application for that. It's gonna give them a static binary that's gonna be really small, uh, efficient, and that, that's a good use case for it right there. Next question. <clears throat> yeah, that was cool. I would like more Doom, but I know. <laughs> um, so when you were showing that the comparison in virtual memory, did you try running read elf l on both? I, Can I you do it now? Yeah. Did I run Elm? No, read elf l on both binaries. One. You want me to run read yeah, elf I do. l I very uh, much do, yes. On the Zig X version? Sorry, on, on both. On both? Okay. 
on Doom? No, no, not here. That was the um, Hello, um, what was it? The... Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Yep. There's one more L. Come on. Does that tell you anything? We, if you can scroll up a bit. This is a black magic language. That Why is it? No, no, look, the, the memory starts at 20,000, right? And it goes all the way up to like 4K. If you scroll down a bit. Like these are, yeah, yeah, see the segments? They start like GNU Railroad has like uh, 20, uh, 20,000, 4,000. Uh, oh, you're telling me why it's using so much memory. Yeah. Ah. And there you go. Like you have a dynamic segment as well. And if you do the same thing for the static one, you're not going to have all the junk. So what, what's the reason why it's using so much? Well, look, all, the, all, the, um, all those segments are um, page lined. Yeah, okay. to 4K. And if you do the same thing, do the, do the read elf on the static one. Yeah, for the, uh, this is the one for ZigX. Oh, right, okay. Um, yeah, that's weird. I think this is actually more here. So there was a reason why they created XCB, and one of the key, one of the first things they said is they wanted it to be modular. And so I have a feeling the reason why it's so big is because it contains a lot of functionality in there. So that, that's my theory anyway. Yeah, but not in the binaries, though. Oh, true. So the, the bindings themselves use that much memory? Oh, right, right, right. right. True. I don't know. <laughs> well, we can carry on on Friday. <laughs> hey, next question. Yeah, just a quick one. Uh, can we get a copy of that Doom with uh, the X11 logo as the, the zombies? That'd be pretty cool, I think. Uh, <laughs> you want a copy of the Doom X11? Like, yeah, the, we can like swap, you know, Doom I can give you with, the uh, engine, Wayland. but I don't think I can give you the WAD file, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> which is where most of the game is. But. Great talk, thanks. Also, what do you say to your critics who claim that you're slowing down Wayland progress by <laughs> making it easier to ship X11 applications? I, I have no comment on that. Okay. I played the fifth. Uh, any more questions? Oh, oh dear. You're a chatty one. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, so the library was horrible. We, we all observed that. How was the protocol? Oh, the, that, I, I wish I would have uh, spent a little bit more time on my slides. The protocol actually wasn't that bad. Oh. Um, and <laughs> um, what I'll say about it is I think that, I, I don't know this for sure because I'm not that intimate with Wayland as much as I am with X11, but I have a theory that X11 could have done everything Wayland has, had done with more extensions. And in fact, a lot of the actual APIs that are mostly used today are done through X11 extensions. And what I liked about X11 is those extensions are standardized and everybody uses them. I'm, well, there's the Xorg server. I don't know if there's any other implementation. But with Wayland, the problem that you get is there's all, di all sorts of different extensions and all sorts of different implementations. And it's, it's a harder problem to wrangle. And it's why Wayland's taken so long to take over. It's because there's all this functionality that X11 already had. And we can't decide on how to implement it in Wayland. So there's my two cents on it. Um, thank you for the talk, Johnny. So um, going back, so stepping away from X11 and going back to your more general point about not overdoing, not over-architecting your, um, over-complicating your APIs with abstraction, um, is there any comment, any, anything that you, interesting that you would like to say about the Z-Standard library? Is there any API there that you think is might be a little bit affected by this? That's a little bit. That's a really good question. Um, it's funny because I'm really impressed with the Zig standard library, actually. Um, I'm sure that there's APIs that everyone can agree um, 
probably were a little bit too ambitious. I think some of the stuff in experimental, some of the stuff, um, I, Lemon Boy had a really good post about standard.net, and I think that's, we made, probably made some mistakes there. Um, but overall, um, I'm really impressed with the Zig standard library and, and how well it's able to resist the temptation to, to do too much abstraction. So I don't have too much criticism there. Any more questions? Was Whalen uh, named after the evil corporation in Alien? <laughs> awesome. I think that's a great place to end it. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Johnny. That was a great talk. Yes. OK. So hi, Johnny. Hi. Um, I usually ask silly questions to speakers in these interviews. In your case, I'm just going to ask you one thing. Can you give? to the audience a piece of wisdom? Ooh, a piece of wisdom. Fuck abstraction. As, as the great Loris once said on Twitch. <laughs> that, that might be an actual quote, yes. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Thank you. That's all I have. <laughs>